Hi, everybody. I'm Donna Prosser, Chief Clinical Officer at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Today, we're joined by Dr. David Ha, who is a pharmacist in infectious diseases and antimicrobial stewardship at Stanford Healthcare. He's going to talk to us about establishing an effective antimicrobial stewardship program. Good morning, David. Thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning, Donna. Thank you so much for the invite. And as you can see, David is following uh, appropriate protocol and wearing his PPE to keep every, himself and everyone else safe by wearing a mask today. So uh, thank you again, David, for joining us at this unprecedented time um, in this pandemic and taking the time to talk to us. Absolutely. So I, I wonder if you could tell us, uh, start by just telling us a little bit about your background. Sure. Um, so I'll start a little earlier. Um, I'm not sure how many folks watching this will be familiar with the background and training of pharmacists specifically, but um, I completed my uh, doctor of pharmacy at uh, the University of California in San Diego and um, did two years of residency um, in uh, general acute care and then infectious diseases um, at the uh, UC San Diego Medical Center. Um, and after that, I spent uh, the better part of six to seven years uh, down in uh, Los Angeles. I was a faculty at the Keck Graduate Institute School of Pharmacy and um, also served as an uh, infectious diseases pharmacist, um, starting and running our antimicrobial stewardship program at uh, the Pomona Valley Medical Center, which is a, a community regional medical center uh, down in eastern Los Angeles County. And um, about uh, a little over a year ago now, uh, I've moved up to the Bay Area and uh, joined the team up here at Stanford. Excellent. Well, uh, you know, antimicrobial stewardship programs haven't been around for that long, um, you know, compared to a lot of other things in medicine. Can you tell us just a little bit about why these programs are important and, you know, what do they typically look like in an organization? Yeah, you know, um, that, that's a good question. And it's kind of an interesting question um, and an interesting comment about how they, they, they it's right, they have, you're, you're right that they haven't been around um, for a long time formally. But, um, but I will say that um, really at a fundamental level, and I, I'm taking this from one of our medical directors here, um, that antimicrobial stewardship really is just good clinical medicine in, infect in infectious diseases. And um, infectious diseases is one of those interesting specialties that is generalized uh, amongst general practitioners. And so, you know, I, I like to use the analogy of if you have cancer and you need chemotherapy, you're not going to do that without um, working with an oncologist and the oncologist really is going to be driving that. Um, you know, if you need a heart transplant, you're going to be working with a cardiologist, a cardiothoracic surgeon, and, um, you know, a number of other specialists. But if a patient comes in with pneumonia or a urinary infection, uh, you're not always going to be consulting with infectious diseases. Um, and so the vast majority of infectious diseases that we encounter in the hospital setting or in the outpatient setting, which is um, an even larger arena uh, in terms of antimicrobial stewardship, um, you know, you, you, you have disseminated that specialty out to, um, out to generalists and it, it's a complex specialty. And so um, it, what's also interesting about infectious diseases is the tools that we use uh, to treat them become less effective over time, the more we use them. And this is relatively unique uh, to the field of infectious disease and the, uh, you know, antibi the antibiotic drug class. Um, in that bacteria and um, to a certain extent as well, uh, fungi and viruses uh, that can cause infections can develop resistance over time. Um, and that prevalence of resistance increases in the population the more we use antibiotics. We obviously need to use antibiotics to treat people, to cure them of their infections. But in so doing, we are increasing that resistance and uh, making it less likely uh, the next time either that patient or another patient um, who has maybe, um, you know, uh, you know, caught the pathogen that they have, um, you know, gets a subsequent infection makes it less likely that the antibiotics we use the first time um, are going to be effective the second time. And, um, and I will say if you take a walk around any intensive care unit or, um, you know, any, any setting like that in a hospital, you will find uh, the consequences of uh, of, of that antibiotic resistance, unfortunately. And so it's a, it's a dire problem that needs to be addressed. Um, thankfully, um, 
uh, organizations like yours have recognized this issue and have um, have really supported this. And um, you know, the federal government and other entities have supported antimicrobial stewardship more recently. And so um, there's been a more concerted effort uh, institutionally to improve antimicrobial use. Um, and that has been more recent. Um, but the concept of antimicrobial stewardship, I would say, is as old as antimicrobials themselves. And so tell us a little bit about when you um, implemented your program. How did you get started um, and, and who did you have to involve in the process? Sure. Um, so I, I will um, I'll, I'll put the caveat that mine is, a, is an experience, is one person's experience and everybody's experience is quite a bit different. Um, but I'm actually going to call back from some prior experience um, in starting an antimicrobial stewardship at a, uh, at a large medical center. Um, it, it takes a village. Um, it's, you know, I, I struggle to, to think about how to answer this question because I, I really don't recall how we started. We just sort of started reaching out into, uh, out into thin air and, and kind of made things happen. But, um, but I will say, traditionally speaking, uh, antimicrobial stewardship programs are, uh, are led by infectious diseases physicians and infectious diseases pharmacists. And um, I think that the synergy of those two professions is, um, is kind of the, uh, the special sauce, if you will, of antimicrobial stewardship. And um, you kind of pair that diagnostic with therapeutic expertise um, that really, you know, sort of serves as, um, you know, uh, an important foundation for antimicrobial stewardship. Um, there's a number of other, and I, I know we, we can talk about this in a second, but uh, you know, there's a number of other professions um, that are critically involved in antimicrobial stewardship as well. Uh, but it really starts there, and that's how I started my program uh, previously um, down in LA. And uh, myself and uh, an infectious diseases physician, actually a set of infectious diseases physicians, um, really took on the directives of the state of California, uh, and then later um, the directives of the Joint Commission and CMS. Uh, to start uh, an antimicrobial stewardship program at our hospital. And, um, you know, we, I think, I think really where, where we started was getting an idea of where we were. Um, we didn't know what to do if we, you know, didn't know where we were and where we were sitting and where we wanted to go um, and where we were in relation to that. Um, so we spent a lot of time in data collection initially, um, looking at our antimicrobial use, doing a number of use evaluations, uh, syndromic use evaluations, like you know, how are we, how are we doing in terms of our treatment of uh, urinary infections? How are we doing in our treatment of uh, pneumonia? What does our res what do our resistance patterns look like relative to the types of antimicrobials that we were we were using? Um, are we using drugs that are way too you know big and broad spectrum when we could be using much more narrow uh, spectrum antibiotics to save some of those broad spectrum antibiotics for um, the times that we actually need them. Um, and so uh, from that, we were able to capture uh, really what our focus areas uh, were going to be and uh, using national practice guidelines um, and, uh, and published literature to, uh, to identify what the most appropriate therapy uh, would be. And we came to um, institutional practice guidelines. Um, we were able to disseminate um, a lot of education about uh, appropriate use of antibiotics, um, education about um, our resistance rates uh, at, uh, at our center, uh, making people aware of uh, various providers, aware of things that they had not really heard of even in you know, many years of practicing at the institution. And you know, the same way you practice medicine in, uh, in medical school or in your, you know, in your residency training is is almost certainly not the way you should be practicing now, um, considering that, uh, uh, considering the changing nature of infectious diseases. And so, um, you know, and that's not to fault any individual. I mean, you know, there's so many other things out there besides uh, treatment of infectious diseases that clinicians need to uh, keep up on. And so, it makes sense that institutions spend some resources to have some individuals uh, collate this information and provide best practices. Um, you know, uh, or help to provide best practices to, uh, to frontline clinicians. Um, so that's really how we started and, um, you know, started talking to a number of people. We got our microbiology laboratory involved uh, very, very quickly. Um, they were a key, key collaborator. Um, you know, we started getting um, hospital administration involved. Um, we, 
you know, we really wanted to, uh, in terms of driving institutional practice, um, I'm sure a lot of folks in, uh, in various areas of uh, patient care quality will understand that it's, it's, it's the profession of herding cats, essentially, and um, your ability to herd cats is, is directly proportional to your effectiveness, I think, um, in a lot of these initiatives. And, um, you know, so we started from the ground up and we also started from the top down at the same time. And so we, you know, we engage frontline clinicians in terms of educations and one-on-one -on -one conversations on the floors um, about their patient that they're taking care of today, right now. Um, and we also engaged hospital leadership uh, as well. And uh, we found a, nat a natural collaboration with infection prevention and control. Um, they look at a lot of things, I mean, namely things like um, Clostridi uh, Clostridioides difficile infections that, um, that are associated with a number of infection prevention issues, but also with antimicrobial stewardship and appropriate antimicrobial use. And so um, that being already an established, um, you know, an established priority uh, of the hospital with, uh, to be quite honest, uh, dollars uh, attached to it when it comes to, um, you know, when it comes to CMS and, um, and other agencies um, and regulatory issues attached, um, that helped to get uh, hospital administration to, uh, to prioritize it um, as well. And I think, you know, as we continue to move on success, um, kind of uh, spurred more success, and so um, it was a it was a nucleating effect, I guess, um, that we got a, a lot of folks um, involved uh, over over that period of time. You know, I love how you said uh, herding cats. I, 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 that's a great <laughs> term, I think. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's way too are, accurate. <laughs> that's right. It is. It is, you know, especially in some kind and any kind of, um, you know, system improvement program. So uh, tell us what specific barriers or maybe resistance did you did you receive when you were trying to get this initiated? Yeah. Um, you know, I think that there's always, you know, anyone who's in antimicrobial stewardship, anyone who's in a lot of uh, areas of, of, of quality and quality improvement, um, we'll, we'll kind of speak to, you know, we'll kind of speak to the, the folks that are resistant to change as, um, as a barrier. And, um, you know, there was, I, I will say that, um, at my former institution, we had an excellent, uh, set of leadership. And so we didn't, thankfully did not run into very many barriers, uh, from a leadership level. But, um, I think from a frontline, frontline clinician, uh, level, uh, I will say for the vast majority of the time, uh, folks were, uh, very collaborative and willing to, um, you know, willing to, you know, have conversations and um, actively try to improve their practice. Um, but I think for some, because the, this idea that um, you have an external entity trying to come in and influence your practice, um, there can be some resistance there that you have, um, you know, you have a lot of, uh, you've obviously spent a lot of time cultivating your practice, you put a lot of thought into it. Um, and to be quite honest, I mean, sometimes we just don't know what we don't know. And so, um, you know, if you don't realize that what you're doing might be um, inappropriate or you're not seeing the downstream consequences um, of, of, of the things that happened as a result of what you did, because that patient is now, um, you know, suffering the consequences outside of, you know, outside of your immediate field of view, um, you know, that, that can be a little difficult for some people. And so um, I will say that um, while we did, while that certainly was not, you know, the majority by any means, um, we definitely had some, uh, had some clinicians that were more difficult, uh, more difficult to work with. Um, but we were able to move the dial with uh, a lot of those folks over time. And, um, and so overall, I think it was, um, it was pretty successful. Um, and I will say, I mean, as you as you can see here, the the other elephant in the room more recently has been um, has been COVID nineteen, and um, you know COVID, you know you you can kind of extend some of the lessons that we've learned here. Um, I mean, it's definitely a lot more dramatic than anything that we've you know experienced in the recent past, but um, you know you can extend it to other things like uh, you know to H one N one and. Um, and, and other potential things, you know, anything that, you know, lies in the future, we just don't really know. Um, and, you know, being, uh, being in infectious diseases, um, we obviously have to, um, you know, we have all had to step up. I mean, you know, really everyone uh, in, in the healthcare industry has had to step up 
um, you know, to this pandemic and um, do all these extra things related to COVID, um, you know, in terms of managing therapeutics. And um, now we're, you know, sort of in the process of delivering vaccine and, um, you know, and other things, uh, stepping up to do these things while also maintaining the quality of work that you were doing before. And so that that is, um, you know, I will say that's an additional challenge. Um, but um, to, you know, to kind of circle back a little bit more uh, fundamentally, because I forgot to mention this earlier, I still think that um, one of the major limitations of stewardship in general, because um, I did some work with, um, with the uh, county public health department down in Southern California when I was there and worked with a lot of other stewardship programs to help them, uh, you know, to help them improve some of the things that they were doing. And, you know, I will say that the number one complaint um, that we've heard from folks is that they just don't have sufficient time to do what they need to do. And, you know, that's an, I, I know that's an easy thing for everyone to say, you know, I wish I had more time. I wish we had more staff. Um, but, but I will say that, you know, there, there have been, you know, there have been a number of studies now that have, uh, you know, have tried to look at what the optimal, you know, optimal number of, um, you know, uh, you know, full-time equivalent staff, whether it's pharmacists or ID physicians, microbiologists, uh, you know, infection preventionists, whomever, uh, depending on the structure of the institution uh, that you need to successfully engage in antimicrobial stewardship. Oh, and information technology as well is, is very important, um, you know, to have dedicated support. Um, you know, to be quite honest, most, most hospitals have taken on antimicrobial stewardship on top of other things that folks were doing. And so, um, I think a lot of institutions have um, have dedicated stewardship uh, personnel now, which is great. Um, but I think we are, you know, we're far from goal in terms of, uh, you know, the numbers of those individuals that are needed. I mean, if you're, you know, if you're sitting in a 650 bed hospital and you're a single person trying to uh, improve antimicrobial use um, for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of prescribers. Um, you know, in a, in a complex and diverse patient population, I think that's, that's just not realistic. And, um, you know, um, I think that, uh, that, you know, regulatory agencies should as well look at um, what type, and I know they are to a degree, um, but um, I guess I would continue to advocate that they look at, um, you know, what type of, uh, you know, uh, human resource support is being given to um, antimicrobial stewardship programs and the diversity of, uh, of that support. That's an excellent point. So what have your outcomes been and, and how did you sustain the program? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think that, uh, outcomes is an interesting, is an interesting thing in antimicrobial stewardship. I, I think that, um, for, I always relate things, um, you know, to, uh, some, some other outcomes that we look at in infection prevention, like, um, like C. difficile or, you know, uh, catheter associated urinary infections, where we're trying to get down to as close to zero as possible. Um, with antibiotics, it's quite a bit different. And, um, you know, zero antibiotic use would obviously be not what we want. <laughs> um, I think the tendency um, in the absence of formal stewardship programs of, of clinicians is to over prescribe, because they, you know, it's, it's about the taking care of the individual now versus the you know larger population and that's a it's a challenging thing to think about for for really anybody um and so the you know the typical outcome initial outcome at least of a stewardship program is to reduce antimicrobial use um but i think that um, and that's certainly what you know uh, uh what we've seen but you know, I think the, the challenge is really trying to get to a level of optimal antimicrobial use. And that is a much, much harder thing to measure um, because there are so many factors uh, that go into the choice of an antimicrobial, even simple things like allergies or, um, you know, uh, other types of potential side effects that uh, a drug may have that uh, to a particular patient that may make another drug um, more optimal, um, even if it is maybe less optimal from a, you know, broader, narrow spectrum perspective. And without reviewing every single patient in the hospital um, in detail, um, it is hard to get to what that appropriate number is. 
Um, but, um, you know, suffice it, suffice it to say, I think that, um, you know, we're getting more and more sophisticated metrics um, over time. Uh, the CDC has made a lot of movements to, um, to, to capture antimicrobial use uh, between hospitals um, and also uh, try to get some semblance of, uh, of a benchmark um, for, for various hospitals. Um, and that, of course, the goal is not zero, um, but perhaps the goal is to look similar to other institutions that look similar to you. All the caveats, you know, notwithstanding, of course. Um, and so, you know, I think that, um, you know, you ask about sustainability, and that's a really important question. Um, you know, I think that what's what's challenging about stewardship is that it's always changing, right? So the or the appropriate, you know, the appropriate use of antibiotics or the definition of appropriate use is always changing, and it will be different next year than it is this year. Um, and how do you herd all your cats and make sure that they're, you know, they're they're there when, um, you know, when those practice guidelines change or, um, you know, when more evidence suggests that, you know, this type of practice is, you know, more optimal than this type of practice. And, um, and that's a, that's a tough one. And it means that you need continued involvement from your, uh, from your antimicrobial stewards, like myself and others, um, to kind of keep this moving, because it is a naturally moving target. Um, but the other thing is you don't want, in my opinion, you don't want your antimicrobial stewards to be doing the same thing today that they were doing five years ago. Um, and I, I'm a huge, huge fan of decentralizing antimicrobial stewardship and that um, there is no way that, um, that I or even 10 of me um, could look at all the patients in my hospital in a day and provide recommendations on appropriate antimicrobial therapy. It's just not it's just not realistic. Um, it's not sustainable and it's not reasonable because you, um, with appropriate education, with appropriate partnerships, um, you can empower frontline clinicians to make those, um, you know, to help to make those assessments, uh, make those decisions, educating physicians, educating pharmacists, um, educating microbiologists, educating nurses. Uh, I think nurses are a huge untapped uh, force in, in antimicrobial stewardship. And um, we we haven't even hit the tip of the ice. We haven't even found the iceberg yet in terms of, um, you know, in terms of engaging nurses. And, um, and I think, um, you know, there, there's, there's a lot to be said a, a about, um, you know, the, the efforts of, you know, what is it? 1% of a hundred people's efforts versus a hundred percent of one person's efforts. Um, and in trying to, uh, in trying to disseminate that knowledge um, and disseminate the activity of antimicrobial stewardship, because again, it's really, it's really just good clinical medicine. And so, um, you know, we're, we're really trying to help to support people to practice good clinical medicine. And so um, I think if you can, you can push the culture of uh, your institution um, to be sort of a continued learning, you know, a learning model, um, and that naturally we will change. Um, the way that I prescribe today will not be the way that I prescribe in two years. I know that and I'm expecting that. Um, that is certainly not the narrative um, that has existed in the past. Um, um, it's really been more so that this is how I treated a urinary infection back in 1976, and so that's how I'm going to treat it today. Um, and so I think I think those types of efforts are are really important. Uh, it's it's hard to be specific in that regard, but I think that um, but that is probably one of the most valuable things um, that uh, that an antimicrobial stewardship uh, program can do. The last thing I'll say on that is just to quote a, um, a qualitative researcher in antimicrobial stewardship. Um, uh, I, and I, this may be a quote from somebody else, but, um, but culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And so you can have all the strategy you want, but if you don't have the culture change in your institution, um, you're, you're going to be, you're going to be walking uphill for a very long time. It's such a great point about culture. And, you know, it's funny, I always used to say culture eats strategy for lunch, but I really like the breakfast lunch. Dinner. That's great. <laughs> You've given me two things to, to, exactly. to say. Now. <laughs> um, so, so David, um, you know, before we go, any other final advice or recommendations for organizations who are trying to get their programs off the ground? You know, I, I would say that, um, uh, just to just keep at it and, and, and make partners. Um, you know, the, the, 
the interesting thing about stewardship is it, it's it's very rewarding and it can be very taxing at the same time. And I'm sure this will, you know, this will resonate with a lot of folks um, who are in any sort of quality improvement initiative. Um, that you know, if you spend all day herding cats, I mean, it's hard to, uh, it's 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 really hard. It, it can be tough sometimes, um, and it can be disheartening sometimes. You know, if you're, um, you know, if your efforts aren't making their way up the chain, or you're not seeing the outcomes that you know you would like to see. Um, but um, you know, I would say that uh, one thing that certainly um, has kept me going is the people within stewardship, and so. Um, you know, if you can make, if you can help to kind of push people towards being your allies, um, and it's not necessarily always about just put, thinking that you know it all and pushing that, pushing your own agenda, that you're coming in and, you know, you, for some reason, have all the knowledge that nobody else has. Um, I think that that's certainly um, a big fallacy. Um, but, um, you know, talking to people and, you know, getting to understand what issues they're dealing with, um, with antibiotics and trying to think about ways that um, folks can be involved in, uh, in big or small ways um, is, you know, is, is really helpful. And it kind of, it, it really humanizes that um, antimicrobial stewardship approach and, and, and does start to um, change your culture or improve your culture. Um, and, and, you know, every institution can stand uh, to, to improve its culture in, in lots of ways, uh, uh, particularly with regard to um, embracing change. Um, um, and 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 embracing fluidity um, in terms of what they do, and um, yeah, so um, so that that's probably that's probably what I would say. Um, you know, get lots of folks involved, make lots of make lots of friends, uh, try to make as little enemies as possible, um, and you know, get folks on you know get folks on your side, and and a lot of times that means getting on, you know, get getting on everyone else's team, you know, trying to help with other initiatives that. Uh, maybe relate to uh, some of the things that you're doing, you know, some of the things that come to mind certainly would be, like I mentioned, infection prevention efforts. Um, anything that's going on in the microbiology laboratory um, is going to be very, uh, very important. Um, you know, certainly making pharmacy um, your allies, because a lot of institutions will have pharmacists that are, you know, kind of zoned in on the drugs, um, and antibiotics being one of the many. Um, and you know, getting them to you know to recognize um, patterns of maybe suboptimal use, and you know, making recommendations right there um, on their primary services. Um, I, I keep saying this over and over again, but I think nurses really are are, are, are extremely important. Um, they are the you know they are truly the last line of defense when it comes to administering antibiotics, and they're the first line of defense when it comes to recognizing. Um, any adverse drug reactions and any uh, maybe suboptimal outcomes. Um, perhaps the antibiotic we're using is not working to treat the infection. Uh, the nurse is going to be the first one to know about that, uh, not the physician, not the pharmacist. So, um, you know, uh, can we, you know, can we provide our nurses with more training and things, uh, you know, specific things to be, uh, you know, to be looking out for? Um, can we make nurses uh, more critical assessors of uh, antimicrobial therapy um, to capture more of the relevant information um, up front, like like drug allergies. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've I've uh, looked at a chart and it just says allergy to penicillin unknown or the patient vomited or something like that, uh, and uh, you know, and that leads somebody to prescribe something different down the line. Kind of you know, bringing that full circle and having people recognize. Um, you know, the, you know, maybe unexpected consequences of some of the things that might happen um, as a result of, uh, you know, some of the things that they had not even realized that they had done um, initially. And so, um, yeah, I think making, making a lot of friends, making a lot of allies, getting a lot of folks on your team um, as much as possible, um, and really trying to um, invest your pro, uh, you know, their initiatives into your outcomes and, and, and your initiatives into theirs. Um, I think really helps to, um, again, you know, improve that culture and um, really drive, uh, drive lasting change. Wow. Well, David, this has been so incredibly helpful. We really, really appreciate your time. And um, we will let you get back to fighting the pandemic there on the front lines. And thank you, thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Donna. Have a great day. You too.